Lecture 2-1, Signal Energy and Power, Linear Time Invariant Systems. The objectives for today's lecture are to solve problems for signal energy and power, to review linear time invariant systems and convolution, and to find the frequency response for a linear time invariant system. Signal energy and power. For many signals, the signal energy is infinite. This usually occurs because the signal is not time limited. Time limited means it's only non-zero for some specific period of time. For these types of signals, it is usually more convenient to find the average signal power of the signal. The average signal power of signal x of t would be defined to be p is equal to the limit as t goes to infinity of 1 over t, the integral from negative t over 2 to positive t over 2, the magnitude of x of t squared dt, and the units are volts squared. The average physical power delivered to a resistor is given by p is equal to the limit as t goes to infinity of 1 over t, the integral from negative t over 2 to t over 2, the absolute value of v of t squared divided by r dt, and the units would be watts. You should be most familiar with average physical power, which you studied in your circuits analysis course. If v of t is periodic with period t naught, then the average signal power is p is equal to 1 over t naught, the integral over one period, the magnitude of x of t squared dt, and the units are volts squared. You should also notice that this is power, which is vrms squared, for a signal. An energy signal is a signal for which the energy is between 0 and is greater than or equal to that value and less than infinity. A power signal is one for which power is absolutely between 0 and infinity. So the main thing to notice here is that energy can be exactly 0, but power can only be greater than 0 and less than infinity. By these definitions, this means that a signal can either be an energy or a power signal, but it cannot be both. Example 1. Find the power for the signal V of t is equal to 10 cosine 20 pi t volts. The first thing you should notice is that this is a sinusoidal signal, which means it's not time limited, so it's not an energy signal. And since we're going to determine the power, we can assume that it will be a power signal, but we're going to calculate that. So the amplitude of the sinusoid A is equal to 10. The frequency, omega naught, is equal to 20 pi radians per second. And the fundamental period, T naught, is equal to 2 pi over omega naught, which is 1 over 10 seconds. So we can find the power, which we know is going to be VRMS squared. But remember, the RMS value for a sinusoid is the magnitude divided by the square root of 2. So if power is equal to VRMS squared, that's equal to A squared over 2. And remember, this is because the RMS value for a sinusoid is A over the square root of 2. So this is going to equal to 100 divided by 2, or 50 volts squared. So V of t equals 10 cosine 20 pi t volts is indeed a power signal. Example 2. Find the power for the following signal. x of t is equal to 5 rect of t over 2 times 10 to the negative 6, which repeats every t equals 5 microseconds, and 0 otherwise. We already know this is not going to be a time-limited signal, so it's not going to be an energy signal. But let's make a sketch of what x of t looks like. So x of t looks like a rect centered at the origin with an amplitude of 5 and a width of 2 times 10 to the negative 6, which means that the rect has stops at a positive value of 10 to the negative 6 and stops at a negative value of negative 10 to the negative 6. And then the ne next rect is centered at 5 times 10 to the negative 6 and negative 5 times 10 to the negative 6. And then it repeats. So we know that T naught is equal to 5 microseconds. So to find the power, power is going to equal 1 over T naught, the integral from negative 10 to the negative 6 to positive 10 to the negative 6, x of T squared dt, 
which is 1 over 5 micro, the integral from negative 10 to the negative 6 to positive 10 to the negative 6, 25 dt, which equals 25 divided by 5 micro times 2 micro, which equals 10 volts squared. So once again, we have a power signal. Example three, find the power for the following signal. G of t is equal to e to the j omega naught t. Now remember, e to the j omega naught t is a complex exponential. So t naught is equal to two pi over omega naught. But we can sketch a complex exponential as a vector. So this would represent a vector with a magnitude of one that's rotating at omega naught t where if omega naught is positive, it rotates counterclockwise as t increases, or if omega naught is negative, it rotates clockwise as t increases, right? So we can also mark this with the real part as cosine omega naught t, and the imaginary part, which would be j times sine omega naught t. And we can immediately see that this is going to be a power signal and not an energy signal, because the energy is infinity. So P is equal to one over T naught, the integral over T naught, the magnitude of X of T squared DT, which equals omega naught over two pi, the integral from zero to two pi over omega naught, the magnitude of e to the j omega naught t squared dt, which equals omega naught over two pi, the integral from zero to two pi omega naught. Remember the magnitude is one, so that's one squared dt, which equals omega naught over two pi t, Evaluated from zero to two pi over omega naught, which equals one volt squared. So some reminders. Remember, R is equal to one ohm, and P is equal to VRMS squared in every case for average signal power. And also, does every signal have to be an energy or a power signal? Not necessarily. An energy signal has zero average power and is not a power signal. A power signal has infinite energy and it's not an energy signal. As we said before, you can't have a signal that's both. It's either power, energy, or neither. Some signals that are neither an energy or power signal would be, for example, e to the negative 2t. Because if you sketch e to the negative 2t, that has a value for all time, which means when you integrate it, from negative infinity to infinity, you won't get a value. And tangent omega t is another example. Random noise is considered a power signal, but some noisy signals are not power signals. Let's look at a figure. So here we have an example of two random noise signals. The top one is a power signal, the bottom one is not. Can we determine what the difference is? Well, you can see that the top one is constrained to be between some values, and it looks like the average may even come out to be zero, whereas the bottom one is constantly changing, although the values are random. So that one you cannot integrate over some period and come up with a finite value. LTI systems. Given an LTI system, we would like to predict the output y of t for an arbitrary input x of t. The way we model this system is the input x of t. We have a block to represent the LTI system, and the output is y of t. We use a basic signal, such as a complex exponential, an impulse, or a unit step, to find the response, and then use this response to any signal that can be decomposed of the basic signal. For example, if bi of t is my basic signal, then I can rewrite x of t as a linear combination of bi of t. So that'd be the summation over i of alpha i, b sub i of t.
And now, since I know how the system responds to just be I of t, I know how y of t responds as long as I have a linear time invariant system because y of t would be equal to if the response to b i of t is g i of t, which we'll call the response to the basic signal, y of t is a linear combination of g i of t, so that would be the summation over i of gamma i g sub i of t. In EC204, phasor analysis was used to find the response for a sinusoidal input in the frequency domain. We now know that a sinusoidal input is a linear combination of complex exponentials. And the inverse phasor transform can be used to find the sinusoidal steady state response of the system as given by the following equation, where h of j omega is the frequency response. So in the frequency domain, the LTI system input and output becomes y of j omega is equal to h of j omega x of j omega. In EC205, the following convolution integral was used to find the output y of t of an LTI system to an arbitrary input x of t, where h of t is the impulse response of the system. So for this one, we use the impulse as our basic signal. So y of t was equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity, h of tau, x of t minus tau, d tau, or the integral from minus infinity to infinity, x of tau, h of t minus tau, d tau. So as long as we could find the impulse response h of t, we could find the response of the system to any arbitrary input. In EC205, we also did Laplace analysis, where this was used to find the response of a system to an arbitrary input. And the inverse Laplace transform can be used to find the transient and steady state response of the system as given by the following equation, where s is equal to sigma plus j omega, and h of s is the transfer function. y of s is equal to h of s times x of s. Remember, the transfer function h of s is directly related to the impulse response and the frequency response, where after the transient has died off, h of s would be equal to s equals j omega for sinusoidal steady state. Response to a complex exponential. A signal with exactly one frequency is a complex exponential or complex sinusoid. You can write any function as a sum of complex exponentials. If we know how a system responds to a complex exponential function, we know how it responds to any function. We generally use two sets of basic signals, the unit impulse and the complex exponential. The impulse leads to the convolution and the complex exponential leads to Fourier analysis, which is what we study in this course. Now let x of t equal e to the j omega t, which represents any complex exponential input to an LTI system and solve for y of t. We're going to do this by using the convolution, y of t equals the integral from minus infinity to infinity, h of tau, x of t minus tau d tau. So y of t is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity, h of tau, e to the j omega, t minus tau d tau, which equals the integral from minus infinity to infinity, h of tau, e to the j omega t, e to the negative j omega tau, d tau. So the integral from minus infinity to infinity, h of tau, e to the negative j omega tau, d tau. We're going to define that as h of j omega and multiply it by e to the j omega t. So this equals h of j omega times e to the j omega t. So the main thing I want you to note here is that our input was e to the j omega t, and our output also has e to the j omega t in it, which means that e to the j omega t is like our basic signal. So if I draw this in terms of the system, here's my system input. I now represent my system model as h of j omega. And then my system output is e to the j omega t times h of j omega. So the input was a complex exponential, and the output has a complex exponential. So this is why e to the j omega t is our basic signal.
Note that the LTI system response to a complex exponential is another complex exponential. Therefore, the eigenfunction of the LTI system is e to the j omega t, and the eigenvalue of the LTI system is h of j omega, and it is also called the frequency response, which we've referred to before, where h of j omega is the integral from minus infinity to positive infinity, h of tau e to the negative j omega tau d tau. The simplicity of the response is the reason that complex exponentials are used as basic signals. A family of basic signals can be used to find the response of an LTI system by using a linear combination of the basic signals as the input, and the response to a particular input is a linear combination of the basic signal responses. Can we express any general signal x of t as a linear combination of complex exponentials? The answer is actually yes, although it will not be readily apparent until we get to Fourier series. So Fourier series can be used to, for any periodic signal. So it would be x of t is equal to summation over k from negative infinity to infinity, a sub k e to the j omega sub k t as your input, and your output y of t would be the summation from k equals negative infinity to infinity, a sub k h of j omega e to the j omega k t. Fourier transforms can be used for any periodic and some periodic signals as well. And it will be defined as x of t is equal to the negative infinity to infinity a of omega e to j omega t d omega, where the output y of t is the integral from minus infinity to infinity a of omega h of j omega e to j omega t d omega. So the bulk of this course will be us exploring Fourier series and Fourier transforms before we then move on to another topic. Properties of the frequency response h of j omega. If h of t is real valued, which means it does not have any complex values, then h of t is equal to h conjugate of t. What is h of j omega? So in this box here, we're going to determine what h of j omega would be. So h of j omega is the integral from not minus infinity to infinity, h conjugate of t e to the negative j omega t dt. We replaced the original definition of h of j omega where h of tau is now h conjugate of tau. So in the next step, we're going to have the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the quantity h of tau e to the j omega tau conjugate d tau. So then this is going to equal the integral from minus infinity to infinity h of tau e to the j omega tau d tau, that entire quantity conjugate. And what you should see here is that this equals h of negative j omega conjugate, which equals h conjugate of j negative j omega. So now let's solve for h of negative j omega h of negative j omega is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity h of tau e to the negative j negative omega tau d tau which equals the integral from minus infinity to infinity h of tau e to j omega tau d tau this can be written as the quantity from minus infinity to infinity, h conjugate of tau, e to the negative j omega tau, d tau, which can also be written as the quantity and the conjugate of negative infinity to infinity, h of tau, e to the negative j omega tau, d tau, and that's because h of t is real, and the conjugate, which equals h conjugate of j omega. So what we have shown here is that, so what we have shown here is that h of j omega is equal to h conjugate of negative j omega. And we've also shown that h of negative j omega equals h conjugate of j omega. So if we make a sketch of this, we get that the magnitude of h of j omega is even means it looks like this. And we get that the angle 
of h of j omega is odd, which means one example for that would look like this. So if h of t is real, we say that h of j omega has Hermitian or conjugate symmetry, which means that h of j omega equals h conjugate of negative j omega, or h of negative j omega equals h conjugate of j omega, which yields the following two equations. The magnitude of h of j omega has even symmetry, which means the magnitude of h of negative j omega equals the magnitude of h of j omega, and the phase has odd symmetry, which means the angle h of negative j omega equals the angle negative the angle of h of j omega. And this concludes lecture 2-1 on signal energy and power and LTI systems.